Hello and welcome to Project 152, your weekly exam prep. Now every week we go through questions from the QCAA. If you stick with us the whole time, you'll have done every single question the QCAA has ever done. Uh, this is week 17. We're going to go through the solutions here. If you're hearing my voice and you're hearing it's a little croaky, I am a little bit sick, but we're going to push through, we're going to get it done, on to the first question. So this style of question is really tricky unless you know the trick to it. Once you understand how to approach these kinds of questions, much, much easier. So the way to do it is to look at key areas of our graph and figure out what the gradient is doing in those key areas. So what I mean by that is look in quadrant one here. Every gradient in quadrant one is positive. All right, let's keep that in mind. Look in quadrant two, every gradient is positive, positive, positive. I don't care what the values are. What I care about is whether it's positive or negative. Here, every gradient is negative. Let's write that down. And here, every gradient is negative. Let's write that down. There are some two, two other important places that we can look at. We can look at the x-axis. Everywhere along the x-axis, it looks like the gradient is zero. And we can look along the y-axis, and it looks like along the y-axis, there are no gradients there. So a way to think about no gradients is the gradients are infinite. So I've got six key points that I can deal with, and now we just need to look at our four answers and see if our four answers spit out positive gradients in quadrant one, positive gradients in quadrant two, negatives in three and four, zeros in x's, and infinites in Y's. All right, so I'll jump into the first one. So let's consider quadrant one. In quadrant one, X is positive and Y is positive. So in quadrant one, X and Y are positive. Now let's look at our four solutions. A positive 5Y divided by a positive makes a positive, which is what we're expecting. All right, so A might be our answer. What about B? A positive, so a positive squared is still positive. So 5Y squared is positive. Positive divided by positive, positive, B might be our answer. What about C? Positive divided by a positive, uh, positive might be our answer, and a positive divided by a positive, positive might be our answer. All right, so we've looked at quadrant one, and quadrant one hasn't helped. Everything could be an option here. A nice little table might help. So in quadrant one, everything works. All right, what about quadrant two? We're expecting everything to be positive in quadrant two as well. All right, let's take a look here. Now, in quadrant two, x is negative. So keep that in mind. A positive 5y divided by a negative makes a negative. So option A doesn't work in quadrant two because we're expecting a positive result. What about this one? 5y squared, now y is positive in quadrant two, divided by the negative, that makes a negative two. So B doesn't work. Okay, what about C? 5Y, Y is positive in quadrant two, divided by X squared. Now X in quadrant two is negative, but X squared, a negative times a negative is positive. So we have a positive divided by a positive. That means that option C works. Positive divided by positive is positive. And this one here, that's gonna be positive. That's gonna be positive, so option D works. All right, so I'm down to two options. It's either C or D. One of these is going to be the answer. Let's go to quadrant three. Um, we're expecting negative gradients. All right, so we have a negative Y, negative divided by, that's going to be positive, because negative X squared is positive. So what is that going to give us? That is going to give us a negative gradient. What about this one? Uh, 5y squared, now y is negative, but squared is positive. x is negative, but x squared is positive. So positive divided by positive makes positive. C does, D, sorry, does not work. D does not work. So I don't care about what's happening with this one and this one because they've already been ruled out. Option C is our winner. We don't need to go further than that. Our answer is C. Now, I like to do the quadrants first. You can use um, the x-intercept and the y-intercept if you need to go further than that by letting x equal zero and letting y equal zero. But in this case, considering our quadrants is enough. 
Do we know exactly any of these values? No, but knowing whether they're positive, negative, zero, or infinity is enough to get this job done. Almost forgot. Next question. So a wonderful little proof here using complex numbers. So we've got this weird thing going on here. We know what Z1 and Z2 is. So we need to set up this direct proof. I've been teaching direct proof to my 11 specialist students, so I know how to do that. We need a left-hand side and we need a right-hand side. All right, so my left-hand side is Z1 over Z2 and then find the magnitude of that. My right-hand side is find the magnitude of Z1 divided by the magnitude of Z2. So slightly different. Now, normally I'd sort of line these up on my page, but here's where I am, so this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, now I'm gonna put in my Z1 and Z2 values in each side, so I get a really good understanding of what I've got. I'm trying to find the magnitude of A plus BI over and then I have this C plus DI. And then on this side, I'm trying to find the magnitude of A plus BI over the magnitude of C plus DI. Now, it's not immediately apparent that these two things would be equal. You could feel like you can like magic it up somehow, but you really have to show through a series of algebraic steps that they are in fact identical. Dealing with the right hand side here looks easier because I think I can just get this done in one step. Um, the magnitude of any complex number is equal to the square root of the real component plus the square, oh sorry, the square root of the real component squared plus the imaginary component squared. And that's the same for the bottom. The square root of c squared plus d squared. Okay, so that is as far as I want to take that. I guess I could put like a single square root over the whole thing, but this feels like a good spot to sort of leave that alone. I might come back to it later if I need to like play with it, but for now, that's good. Okay, this one. This one's interesting. Now there are two methods to solve this. I'm gonna solve it the way that I would probably solve it under exam pressure, um, which is probably not the most elegant way, but I'm gonna do it the way that I think most people would solve this. All right, so what I have is a complex number divided by another complex number. And you should have learned way back that you can divide a complex number by a complex number using the conjugate. So taking this and multiplying it by C minus DI over C minus DI, a single fraction here, eventually our denominators are gonna become a, a real component and we'll be left with a single complex number. Okay, so multiplying bottom by bottom is the easiest place to start. Um, so it's just bracket, 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 and we're multiplying bottom by bottom and, and top by top. So we get a C squared, and then the magic of this is what you're left with is C times negative DI and C times positive DI. So those two terms cancel each other out, and then we've got a positive DI times a negative DI, which gives us negative uh, d squared i squared. And of course, i squared is equal to negative one, which means that we end up with positive just d squared. Now, you shouldn't have to sort of do all of that because you should see c plus di, c minus di, and know straight away that it's gonna be c squared plus d squared. Uh, the top takes a little more work because we actually have to think about what we're doing. a times c is a C, A times negative DI is negative A, D, I. Uh, B, I plus C is positive B, C, I. And then our last term here, be a little bit careful with it, and here's the trick. Um, positive B, I times negative D, I is negative B, D, I squared. I squared is negative one. So that leaves us with positive B, D. Okay, lovely. All right, so where are we gonna to go to from here? Well, we have uh, a bunch of two I components and two real components. So let's group those uh, real components and group those imaginary components. All right, so I have AC plus BD, that's the real components, and then I have these imaginary components, BCI and negative ADI, which I write here as BC minus AD 
an eye on the outside, a little bit of factorizing while I'm at it. And then it's still all over c squared plus d squared. Now, it's more useful to us because eventually we're going to try the magnitude here to fully split this into real component, imaginary component. So because it's uh, something plus something plus something over a full thing, we can break this into those fractions. We can break it into three fractions. It's going to make more sense to break it into two fractions, a real fraction and an imaginary fraction. Beautiful. C squared plus D squared, so that's our real component, the whole thing, and here's our imaginary component right here. All right, moving along. Now, this, it's hard to see, but this, AC plus BD over C squared plus D squared is a single number. It's the real component of this full complex number. This is a single number. It's the imaginary component. We're trying to find the magnitude of it. So the magnitude of it's going to be equal to the square root. Sorry about that question. It's going to be equal to the square root of all of this squared plus all of this squared. Okay, I've done most of the work. I've written all of those out, but I haven't squared this yet and I haven't squared this yet. Now it's tempting to put the full bracket around the whole thing and square it like that and put the full bracket around and square it like that. But what's going to be more useful to me and follows our index laws is I can square the top and I can square the bottom independently of each other. And we get this thing here. Now, it, it always gets worse before it gets better in these kinds of proofs. So it's going to get pretty big and then we're going to come back down again and hopefully we're going to end up here. Now, I know in this previous step, we split it into two fractions. Now is a good time to sort of bring it back into a single fraction. So we have c squared plus d squared squared. And then we're going to put in all of these other terms. So I'm not going to make you watch me expand ac plus bd squared, but it's ac plus bd times ac plus bd. And so you're just using the FOIL method on that and then doing the same with the next term, things are going to cancel out eventually. So what do I see when I can when I do this? I see some cancelling, 2ACBD minus 2ABCD. doesn't matter that the letters are in different orders, they're the same thing. And I'm left with AC squared, BD squared, BC squared, AD squared, and on the bottom, C squared plus D squared, all squared. Now this next part is a little tricky to understand what's going on, but let's check it out. AC squared is the same as A squared times C squared. BD squared is the same as B squared times D squared. Same here, same here, right? What we can see is that there's two terms with an A in them. You can do this with any of the letters, but let's use A. Two terms with an A in it. A squared, C squared, and A squared, D squared. Let's put that A squared out the front and then multiply it by c squared and multiply it by d squared. This, when expanded, gets me back to here. And I can do the same. Uh, let's do it with b. So we end up with a b squared bracket. And again, we've got a c squared and a d squared. All right, that should feel like a quadratic factorization. Because now that we've got a squared times c squared plus d squared and b squared times c squared plus d squared, we can put them together as a squared plus b squared times c squared plus d squared bracket. And all of that can get divided by c squared plus d squared squared. And finally, we have a c squared plus d squared on the top we have a c squared plus d squared squared on the bottom, so we can div we can cancel out one of those c squared d squareds. <coughs> a squared plus b squared over c squared plus d squared. Okay, what have we lost? We've lost our square root the whole time. Perfect. And then... Looking, looking, looking. They look very, very similar. The only change I'll make is to my right-hand side. 
nothing wrong with doing this and they look identical now the left hand side equals the right hand side all right um, that is worth celebrating now before I move on, I will tell you there is a more efficient way to go about this. Now I'm not going to go through this in depth, you should explore this yourself. Go to examinsights.com, check out this solution. Um, this is method two that the QCAA proposes. It proposes converting um, the first complex number and the second complex number into polar form. And that feels like a logical leap, but when we've got them in polar form, when we divide them by each other and want to know the magnitude of that thing, notice we don't know the angles, we can't find the angles, but it doesn't matter because we've got a complex number, we know the magnitude of it. The magnitude is this piece right here. And so then those angles become superfluous, they just go away and it just magically gets down straight down to here. Um, so there's not a great deal of working at all in this one but it takes a leap to look at the question written in Cartesian form and the left hand side and the right hand side are both in Cartesian form and then to think I'm going to convert this to polar form because the angles which I can't find will probably just disappear. This to me is a, a great solution and if you're a keen student you should dissect this solution but the solution I've presented today just feels like the solution that most students would move towards in an exam situation so that's the one I spoke about but I really did want to mention this because it is a beautiful it's a more elegant proof than the proof that I've suggested today but it is a logical leap. Okay next question. So here's our question, use partial fractions to determine this. Okay, let's dive straight into it. So we don't think about integration at all, we just consider the partial fraction for now, and that's going to be equal to a over 2x minus 3 plus b over x plus 4. Okay, and then we multiply both sides of our fraction um, by, in this case, multiply top and bottom by x plus 4, and in this case, multiply top and bottom by 2x, uh, by 2x minus 3, we end up with a times x plus 4 plus b times 2x minus 3. Okay, and I'm sort of ignoring the bottom here because hopefully you know how this plays out. You end up with this, 2x minus 3 times x plus 4 and then you end up with the same on the left hand side 22 and the same denominator so you actually don't need the denominators at all which means that you can sort of um, because partial fractions is such a well understood sort of technique we can jump from this line to this line as long as you know what you're doing Okay, from here we need to find the value of a and we need to find the value of b. Now to do that we let x equal convenient values. If I let x equal negative 4, this whole thing is going to disappear. I'm going to left with b equals something. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to let x equal negative 4. And so the left hand side is still going to be 22. This is going to be 0 and then we're left with this b times 2 times negative 4 minus 3 and then this is just a relatively straightforward equation to solve negative 8 um, negative 3 negative 8 negative 3 is negative 11 negative 11b which means that b is equal to 22 divided by negative 11 negative 2 b is equal to negative 2 and we do the same thing for a uh, now, sorry, we do the same thing for b. So we, what do we need to let this equal to make this whole thing 0? I might need to work that out. For 2x minus 3 to equal 0, 2x equals 3, x equals 3 over 2, I need to let x equal 3 over 2. And then we do the same thing again. Uh, we have 22 on the left hand side. We sub in um, 3 over 2 for x here. So we have a bracket 3 over 2 plus 4. And then, oh, this is pretty, pretty ugly here. Um, 
3 over 2 plus 4. 4 is the same as 8 over 2. So I've got like 11 over 2. 11 over 2. And then solving that for A, so 22 divided by 11 over 2 is the same as 22 times 2 over 11. Uh, that's 44 over 11. A is equal to 4. Beautiful. I know that A is equal to 4 and B is equal to negative 2, so I can put it back into this original. All right, so we have um, the integral of the thing we were initially trying to find equal to the integral of this nice partial fraction that we've created. All right, and now we're just integrating that in its entirety. Now this first one here, I might just rewrite it slightly. And it might not look immediately apparent why I'm putting that two out the front, but it's because I want to integrate this and I've got this nice LN situation happening here. I'm going to end up with two ln 2x minus 3. I need the derivative on the top, of the derivative of the denominator on the top for this piece to work. All right, and now I've got this next one here, um, which is going to be negative 2 ln x plus 4. Um, now that's the integral of it, so it needs like a plus c on the end. Um, use partial fractions to determine the integral of this, I think I've done it. The only thing you want to remember is that these are not brackets. We want these to be our little absolute values. Okay, so straight lines, not, not brackets. Boop, boop, done. That's part A, done, finished. I'm going to rub all of this out except for that because we're going to move on to part B. So here we are at part B. We're trying to find the integral between 0 and negative 3 of this. Now we know that this is actually equal to this, and now we just need to sub 0 and negative 3 into our integration. So we're going to put 0 in for x, we're going to put negative 3 in for x, and they're going to be subtracted from each other. So that's what it looks like. Uh, I've subbed in 0, 0, and I've subbed in negative 3 and negative 3. Now these absolute values signs are going to play a crucial role, right? Because the absolute value of 2 times 0 minus 3, that's minus 3, but the absolute value is just 3. Minus 2 ln, the absolute value of 4 is 4, minus 2 ln. We end up with negative 6, negative 3, that's negative 9, but the absolute value is positive 9. And then minus, minus, so positive 2 ln, Negative 3 plus 4 is 1. Okay, uh, looking pretty good. Now I spot two things here. We're thinking log laws now, right? Everything now is just log laws method stuff. 2 ln 1, uh, ln 1 is equal to 0, so 2 times 0 is 0. So that's gone. Boop. And we're left with this. Everything has a factor of 2, so I'll just bring that out the front. ln 3 minus ln 4 uh, minus ln 9. And then we should be thinking log laws 2 ln 3 divided by 4 and divided by 9. 2 ln 3 on 36, that's ln 1 on 12. You're not getting it any simpler than that. That's my final solution to ln 12. Celebration! All right, so we've got a fun little uh, volume of solid of revolution here. Uh, the region between the x-axis and the curve of this function between 0 and pi on 2 is rotated around the x-axis. So very quick drawing. I've got no idea what the curve looks like, but let's just assume it looks something like that. We're rotating it around here, and we're going to get some sort of object. Okay, that's the drawing done. Um, really, this is relatively straightforward. We're just subbing it into the volume of solid of revolution formula. So use your formula sheet. There it is right there. Let's write that down. All right, so the volume is going to be equal to pi between pi on 2 and 0. And then the function, which is 1 plus sine 2x. But then we have to square the function with respect to x. And so the tricky bit in these questions is always the fact that the function, when it gets squared, starts to get sort of tricky. 
All right, squaring 1 plus sine 2x is probably my first step here. Uh, expanding this, remember it's 1 plus sine 2x times 1 plus sine 2x. So you multiply this by this, this by this FOIL method. And this is what it looks like when we expand it. Now, look at it carefully. Integrating the number 1, not a problem. Integrating 2 sine 2x, not a problem. But integrating sine squared 2x, that's going to cause issues. So sine squared 2x, a problem. You need to hunt your formula sheet for a good trig identity that's going to make this easier to deal with. And I found, you can see this sine squared a sitting right there. Sine squared. So I've sort of searched my formula sheet. I found a sine squared a. And it's related to cos 2a. So let me just write that whole formula down for myself. So we know that cos 2a equals 1 minus 2 sine squared a. Okay, um, now I don't have cos 2a, I have sine squared a. So I can rearrange that formula to make it cos 2a minus 1 uh, divided by negative 2 makes sine squared a. Maybe instead of divided by negative 2, I could multiply it by negative a half. But in any case, this formula now deals with this quite nicely. Now, I don't have sine squared a, I have sine squared 2x. So I'm substituting 2x into this formula instead of a. All right, let's rewrite this whole thing again. We've got pi, we've got pi on to zero, one plus two sine two x plus. And then this sine squared a is gonna become this. So let's rewrite it as negative a half, negative a half, cos two a, cos um, a is two x, so two times two x is four x. And then I've got this minus one here. And that minus one is being multiplied by that as well uh, with respect to x. Okay, very nice because integrating this is straightforward, integrating this is straightforward, and integrating cos is straightforward. I can expand these brackets if I want to as well, uh, if that helps. And I think I will expand those brackets because there's a one here. If I do negative one, negative a half times negative one, I get positive one half. 1 plus positive a half is 3 on 2. So that's going to be my first little bit here, 3 on 2. And then I've still got that 2 sine 2x here. And then my last little bit is not positive. It's going to be negative, negative 1 half cos 4x with respect to x. I've sort of jumped through two steps here, but make sure you understand it. I've expanded this to give this, and I've expanded this, and then that's a number, and I've brought that number together with that one to make three on two. Just grab a piece of paper, do it yourself, you'll end up in the same spot. Okay, we are just integrating this now. That's relatively straightforward, that's method stuff. All right, three on two x, uh, this becomes cos, this becomes sine, make sure we divide by that, um, that coefficient there, done. Now, we're substituting pi on 2 in for everything, substituting 0 in for everything, and solving that. All right, so it gets big, but it all sort of cancels out, all becomes 0. We have a pi here. Okay, um, now this bit here is 3 pi on 4. And then our next piece here is negative cos 2 pi on 2, which is the same as cos pi. Cos pi is um, negative 1. So negative, negative one is positive one. Now this is sine two pi. Sine two pi is zero, so this whole thing becomes zero. And then we have minus zero. And then we have minus, minus cos zero. Now cos zero is one, minus one, minus, minus one, which is plus one. And then this, sine zero is zero, so minus, minus zero zero. I am really finished now. My final answer is the area is equal to pi bracket 3 pi on 4 
plus two. All right, and it's a sorry, it's a volume, it's units cube, not an area. All right, final answer. We are done. I'm celebrating that one. All right, that is the ball game. Uh, that is week seventeen done and dusted. Now, I haven't put up week 18 questions yet. Uh, it's the holidays, so take your time, relax, but also, you've got three weeks worth of holidays. It wouldn't be a terrible idea if you missed some past uh, Project 152s, go back and do some of those questions. This is a really good time to start preparing yourself um, for this final stretch. Um, in September holidays, we'll be doing Project 152 throughout those holidays to knock over all 152 questions. Um, but this is another opportunity for you to catch up if you've missed anything or just to revisit questions that you think you might have forgotten about. All right. Catch you in a few weeks.